Hey, everybody. This is Perpetual Motion with Dr. Mo Anderson. Listen, did you guys see that movie? What was it? Nomad Land? It was a 2020 drama, Western drama with Frances McDormand, who is a hella actress. It won the Academy Award for Best Picture. And I saw it. It, it really was. It should have won the Academy Award. It was really good. It was about a woman in her 60s who, after losing everything in the Great Recession, embarked on a journey living as a van dwelling modern day nomad. And there was this whole community of people who live in vans and just go from place to place. And I, I thought it was interesting fiction. I had no idea. People really live like that. How fascinating. And our guest today, V.V. Tai, is a writer, truth seeker, healer, who is fearlessly determined to live a free lifestyle and she lives in a van. She's an amazing woman. At the end of 2017, she started a new life in Canada as a new immigrant from Vietnam. Before she went to Canada, she achieved a Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering at Texas A&M University. Let, let's put this out here. And a Master's of Biomedical Engineering from Cornell University. So we're not talking about somebody who just couldn't do life. This clearly, clearly is a woman who could do corporate life or any type of life that she wanted. But she wanted to live in another country and have a one-of-a-kind nomadic van life adventure and today we're going to talk about how, how Bai helps others find their path of freedom to live their authentic selves because only then, only then can we all be living a fulfilled life of happiness. Stay tuned. You can't say Dr. Mo ain't tell ya you that fear Magnifies the consequences of failure What are you scared of? Why are you afraid? I'd rather live like I'm dying than live to die Any day my heart is pure and my soul is safe Vivi, welcome to Perpetual Motion Hi Dr. Mo, thank you so much for having me here, it's my pleasure I, I am, I've been excited ever since our pre-call introductory chat. I have never met anyone quite like you. And I've met a lot of people. You have such an amazing and, and courageous life. It is very inspiring. I want to start with just talking about your background a little bit. I mentioned in the intro, intro about your uh, engineering degree and uh, what happened in 2017, that you were a new immigrant from Vietnam to Canada. But tell us about being a, in the U.S. as an international student. That's not an experience everyone has. Yes, absolutely. So I came to the U.S. when I was only 17 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, I came along by myself to be uh, an exchange student in the U.S. And it was quite an experience for me. Uh, I was just thrilled to be able to open myself to a different culture. And I have always loved to explore the world ever since I was little. So, of course, that experience um, really changed everything uh, for me. And I ended up staying in the U.S. Uh, since I was 17 up until uh, my grad school and my last job in the U.S. as a clinical engineer. So I lived in the U.S. for 12 years. So that's over a decade nice. um, being a student to an exchange student, to an international student, and uh, working at MIT as a research assistant. And then I graduated at Cornell with my master degree from uh, in biomedical engineering. Then I, I ended up working in Boston as a clinical engineer. So my path was very traditional just like everyone else and it has more pressure on me as an international student because it's a lot more difficult to find a job and of course after having 
been in the U.S. for over a decade. I didn't want to go back to Vietnam, especially my uh, my study was about technology and engineering was in a very developed field in Vietnam. So going back to the country was an, an option for me, especially if I wanted to find a job. Um, and over a decade of investment in education, you know, it was a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, it was a lot of money and a lot of time. I'm going to jump in there before we move yeah. to, the, to the next phase. I get that. That was a, a huge investment. But before we continue talking about that experience, I want to go back to you, 17 years old, and leaving your parents, leaving the country to go to school elsewhere. You said you'd always wanted to travel, and I get that, but I left home at 17 as well, and I just went from home to Waco, Texas, to Baylor University, and that was terrifying. <laughs> what, what had occurred with your parents or with your lifestyle that, you know, that, that took a lot at 17? How had they instilled in you that type of independence and, and desire to travel and go to another country? I, I, I don't think my family is really instilled anything in me. It was just me alone okay. that, that wanted to do that. Uh, because I, ever since I was little, I always have a desire to escape. Vietnam, my family. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> now the I truth comes out. You were escaping. It wasn't just adventure. It was escape. I, I, yes. me, I, get it. I, I have a son who I think would say the same thing. <laughs> yes. And that, that's something I talk about in my book. It's, it's all about my background and mm -hmm. how horrible I felt. Uh, over there but it, of course my my family didn't know my, my parents didn't abuse me or anything like that it was just a situation and the circumstance of the family in the country the place that I grew up in I didn't feel like I really belonged there and the opportunity for me going to the U.S. was an like escape for me and I was actually ecstatic I was overly joyful instead of afraid and scared like most of the kids like when they leave their their family and their country and go abroad alone by themselves as just a young age like normally they'll be nervous and scared it wasn't really the case for me at all um i actually i <laughs> i think i was a little too excited Mm -hmm. that I about exploring the world and different culture I almost missed my fly to the U.S. because I took the bus going I had a layover in Korea it was like an eight hours layover and I didn't oh. want to wait in the airport so I took the bus from <laughs> you were very the impatient to, to get to where you were going <laughs> wow I just I I just wanted like to explore right away and it was only a layover and I I, I took like an hour and a half bus to downtown Seoul and the bus was actually one way <laughs> I they didn't really speak English and my English wasn't that good at that time. Uh -huh. uh, the bus driver didn't speak English at all in Korea. Oh. And so I begged him to take me back to the airport. Otherwise, I would be late, but he didn't understand me. But luckily, like uh, we were waiting I, for like an hour after and then a lady came up to the bus and luckily she uh, she spoke English and I explained to her my situation. So, um, so, so she asked the bus driver to drive back to the airport and she was actually assisting me the whole way through the airport, like which gate I have to go just so I didn't miss my flight. Oh, and and are there are just people like that everywhere too. Yes, for those, yes. if, if there's a picture for people who are afraid to, and I'm, traveled a lot as an adult, thankfully. And there are a lot of people who just are afraid to travel alone, particularly women afraid to go to other countries where they don't, you know, speak the language. 
And I, I've found all over the world, people are so helpful. And, and as long as, you know, you're courteous, there's just always somebody, no matter where I've been, there's yes. somebody to help yes. me, even if we have to use Google Translate. And I, I've really felt safer sometimes overseas than I have have here. But a, a lot of people have that fear. And here you were, and this wasn't that long ago, uh, just 17 years old traveling and, and taking a bus because you could you you couldn't stand a long <laughs> layover. So I'm I'm feeling a sense of, of wanderlust and adventure is just innate in you. So it makes sense that doing these things and living the life you do now just came naturally to you. Yes, but, yes. But for so long I actually uh, forgot about my dream and I really lost track of who I actually am after living uh, just following the pattern of the society and living according to the expectation of everyone else had on me you know but oh, yeah mm -hmm. but but I, I ever since I, I travel I started solo travel and I have so many stories about how strangers actually helped me even like in very critical conditions <laughs> um yeah it's the more i travel the more i realize the more i wanted to see and how kind people actually are and i always tell people this that how traveling is just so essential not only to your growth but because you get to understand different cultures you get to open different perspectives yes. it helps you to lose that ego and that pride uh, that embedded in you like a national pride or uh, a, a, um, a regional pride about yourself but when you get to open it and get to see how different people live and how different cultures really operate. You get to not only have high perspective and solutions for uh, problems that may, you may have had in your life, but also diminish that pride and that separation uh, and discrimination between culture to culture between people and people, you know? So the more I travel, the more I, I get to meet people and see how kind people are, then I was like, I don't have that idea, like um, uh, this culture is bad and this right. culture is aggressive and right. it's actually not true, you know? And so, I, yeah, I get that because it, it's, you know, you were talking about the pride regionally or nationally, I think, as you travel, you begin to have more of a pride in humankind, you know, in yes, in yes, us in our connectedness and not what separates and alienates us so much, despite what we may have heard, what may have been reported. When you see it for yourself, whether it's a third world country or Dubai, it really does open up your vision. It's like getting those drops when you go to the ophthalmologist. It just totally changes the way you see things. And so let's let's go to then, uh, you, it sounds like you've got some really happy people around you too. You're in a, yes. you're in a good spot. Are you in Canada now? Yes, I'm in Canada. <laughs> okay, you're in Canada in your van and we are headed that way to be with you there. But in the process, I mean, I read that you believe that as we find our own inner freedom, the world can be free and liberate itself to evolve to a better place in the cosmos. And I'm not quite sure what that means. And I don't really understand alchemy. So those were two of the th questions I couldn't way to ask you is, is what do you mean by finding our place in the cosmos and what is alchemy? That might be the same question, but I'm not quite sure. <laughs> it, it is related for sure, because I, the way that I see alchemy is like a path to the ascension is um, because this path, of course, you will have to go through a lot of challenges, but 
it's a natural part of everything in the universe that's evolved. Uh, so is we, because we are part of the universe. We are part of nature and everything has to change. Everything has to evolve. And alchemy basically means transmutation and transformation. So okay. change is the only constant, right? right. Um, and, but in order to uh, ignite the changes, there has to be some struggles and some obstacles and the challenges. Those are the things that we have to go through in order to make the change because without any of those challenges, everything would just be... Um, consistent and nothing is going to change. So, yeah, yeah our alchemy uh, is like the, if you look at the concept of uh, turning lead into gold, mm -hmm. that's, that's normally alchemy is referred to, the process of turning lead into gold. So lead is basically uh, a, a heavier metal. And gold is a lighter and more precious metal. So lead would have to, like, if you look at the metal work and how they do the metal work, like to transform, um, even in the chemical labs, to transform one chemicals into another chemicals, it needs to involve some heating, uh, some, uh, or dousing it into. Uh, water or uh, solution solvent in order to transform the uh, properties of the chemicals in right. order to a different form. So in alchemy, the stages of alchemy also works with these elements of fire, water, earth, and air in order to transform these, uh, these metals or uh, could, could, can I say that is these metals are like the heavier part of ourselves that we need to get rid of and let go to make us lighter, which help us to evolve and to become the precious and the, the be closer to our higher self. That's a, a so that's, beautiful metaphor. That's yeah, good. and it, I can understand that getting rid of the the heavier parts of the impurities uh, to become our better selves. I I love that um, the way that you're using the the ancient art of of alchemy and the or should I say the ancient concept of alchemy to talk about our life experience I, I definitely understand it better now and yes I knew alchemy in terms of science but not in terms of, of the transformation and transportation of the human mind and soul so uh, that's yeah. really a great way to introduce it to our listeners and to this generation which I believe is, is your goal to reintroduce alchemy to this generation and you you mentioned when we spoke before that we have been program to chaos. Can you expound on that a little bit? You just touched on it, but could you talk about that a little bit more? Yes, absolutely. It's like when we are born, for my case as an example, right, I, I was born in Vietnam um, after just a short period after the war, after the Vietnam War. So uh, the society was still very chaotic and everyone was still trying to survive and there was a lot of hardship back then my parents had to work like around the clock probably they they, they probably sleep for only a couple hours a day and both of them had to work a lot and I was pretty much raised by nannies and I was it's the culture in Vietnam, it's okay to hit children. And I didn't know that. So I didn't really know um, that I was actually abused. So I was- Did you say, hit you said and, hit, you said it's okay to hit children? Yes. Okay, yes, as in yes. like spank them? Or do you yeah. mean like a fist? With, um, 
Oh yes, spank for sure with a stick. <laughs> okay, I just want to be clear because you know yes. but I'm in the south. I'm in the south here in the United States, and it's okay to spank children as as well in in the Bible Belt. But some who those who you know follow that uh, or use that form of discipline would distinguish between an open hand tap on the bottom as opposed to you know, a fist. And then there are others who would say both are abusive, which I think is what what you're saying. Uh, but those are some traditions that are strongly held and, and slowly yeah. changing, but we're not there yet. So I, I just wanted to, for yeah. those who who, <laughs> who might misunderstand, I wanted to be clear on what you meant by that, that you weren't physically abused uh, in the terms of, of, you know, beatings with a fist or whatever by your parents, but getting hit with a no. stick is not easy. I'm not saying that wasn't a, a, a difficult thing for you as well. Yes, and there was only a lot of uh, drama. And of course, there's, there's trauma too in the family. Mm-hmm. So, um, and there was fighting. There was so much fighting and it was, it's, Every fam, I wouldn't say that my family was an exception because I see it around my neighborhood. Um, almost everyone has certain kind of drama, and fighting was just very normal in in my neighborhood at that time. Um, and every day there was some kind of yelling and there's some kind of drama there's some kind of fighting going on even in my family and in my neighborhood and that was the reason why I told you earlier that when I was little I always wanted to escape because there's just so much suffering in that place Um, and is and I was scared a lot because I didn't feel safe being with my nanny when my parents uh, have to go to work all the time even at night day and night they they have to go to work and the the nanny that raised me she she never really loved me she was just there because of her job so she so I guess we have different definition of abuse because um she didn't raise like me and my little brother with love. Well, I understand what you're like, saying. Just, like yo, and just like if you don't eat, if you don't eat, then you're gonna get hit. And yeah. they were just like screaming a lot. And so I, I never really feel safe at home. Mm-hmm. Um, and and my brothers were also fighting, and sometimes they drunk mm-hmm. and they get home and they would hit things, and wow. um, they he he would just. Um, and and he threatened to kill my dad. So um, it's, it, it, it was for that reason that I wanted to uh, leave Vietnam for so long. Right. And so all of those events that took place when I was little, those was like the indoctrination and the, like things that was hurtful to me mm-hmm. that um, I just carry for so long in my subconscious that I didn't know about. Yeah. Well, we we all do that. I mean, the the dysfunction that that you know people call it baggage or you know the mental emotional scars and landmines for all of us, and and certainly that was uh, chaotic for you. And there are other things that people had to deal with, whether it was you know drugs or abandonment or there's there's just a lot. And you're right, we just we can get used to almost anything. I, I've as we speak, the war is raging in uh, Ukraine, and I heard someone, I guess it's been about 100 days now, and I heard uh, someone from Ukraine say the other day that they were going on with their lives, that at first it was scary, but they'd gotten used to it. And yes. we do, we get used to, we adapt, we're so adaptable, yeah. and not always, you know, it's for our survival, but not always in the, you know, in our best interest. And I understand what you're saying, that there was someone there to just keep you safe and watch you, but not meeting your emotional and and spiritual needs, particularly as a child. So how do you go from that? It's 
so many people want to escape an environment, even as an adult. How do you go from that and with with this wonderful um, education that you'd had in Canada and I, I can see a need for structure and balance. How do you go from that to a nomadic lifestyle? I, I'd never heard of it. I said that in the introduction until I saw the movie Nomadland. And then to find out that there are thousands of people living like this quite happily. What? How did that transformation take place? Because I'm fascinated by that. Well, definitely it took a long time for me <laughs> and it was, it wasn't really easy in the beginning because my family didn't really approve of it mm -hmm. and they, they think that I was living like a homeless and so mm -hmm. of course they, my mom was very worried about me and she called me constantly and check on me to make sure that I'm okay right. and yeah, so it's, Especially because my my brother came visit uh, after I think it was my first year living the van life, and I didn't really know how to explain it to him. And of course, he come from Vietnam; he's a very traditional person. So this lifestyle is just never really heard of in Vietnam. For some of people, don't really understand what it is, and. Uh, for my family specifically is already very traditional um, and very conservative as well. <laughs> it, just, it was almost impossible for me to explain and and get them to really understand why I'm doing this, especially because my vision wasn't very clear. Like all I knew was that I wanted to find myself and I, I wanted to know who I am, what my passion is and why do I exist and uh, why do I live here? Um, and for that reason, I chose the van lifestyle because it gives me the opportunity to have more time for myself and just follow my passion and don't worry too much about just keeping up with stuff, yes. keeping up okay. with uh, houses and mortgage and rent. But it, it frees me more time for myself and more time to go and explore the outer world and the yeah. inner world. And that, that's what matters most to me. But in, in their mind, in my, in, in my family's point of view, to them, you have to have a job. You have to have some kind of stability in order to live and stability is everything for them. And I can understand why that's important for them, especially for my parents who already survived the war. Stability means survival, right? right. So, right, so right. they think that if I don't have the job, I don't have security, financial security, I'm not going to be able to survive, especially I'm here by myself in Canada. Well, for, <laughs> like, you know, that, and that's, uh, as a parent, uh, and, and, you know, my parents were like that. They, they definitely wanted me to have, you know, a job and either own a business or, or a job with benefits or that's, you know, just kind of the way we've been groomed to uh, operate. So I can see that. But are, are you saying you, you don't have a job? I mean, you, I know you live in the van. I've seen a little bit of the inside of it. It was, I don't even, and she does mean van, folks. It's not a RV trailer. It is, it is a van. It's a very nice van, but it's uh, very minimalist and very neat, very pretty. I, I looked at it a little bit this morning <laughs> and, and it wouldn't be for everyone. And I, and I like that you're saying that it's you know it's an option and that yes. something and it, that you've had a desire for adventure your entire life and as the nomadic alchemist you've got the freedom now beyond the borders but I guess what I'm wondering is so so many of us come from families 
and that way of thinking of, of material things and being stationary and, uh, you know, that that's how we uh, achieve success. And, you know, it's not at all, I always say success is a side effect, but how do you, one, how do you make a living if you're, I'm not, I'm not trying to get in your business, but what it, what is it that you do now? I know you have the book. And two, for people who do want to make a change, but maybe they're not, you know, maybe the van life, you said it took a while for you. Maybe it's not, that's not something they want to do immediately. How do you start to liberate yourself of these, you know, beliefs that you have to have these things around you and you have to be planted in this one space? Yes. Yeah, so about the job things, of course, in the beginning, it wasn't very easy for me to transition to work remotely, especially coming from the background, being an engineer. Right. Um, so and I didn't want to go back to be an engineer. And even if I could, I could have an engineer job in Canada, Vancouver, but it didn't work out for me. Uh, when I lived in the U.S., I knew that wasn't the path for me. I knew I didn't want to live the corporate life anymore. And coming to Canada was like the second chance for me to re-establish myself, to rebuild my foundation. Mm -hmm. And I decided that no matter what, I'm just going to follow my heart and my passion and see what comes out of it. So when I came to Canada and decided to live the van life, I will actually, I started three months after I moved to Canada in Vancouver, BC. Um, uh, of course, starting out, it was, it, it was difficult. I wasn't able to travel a lot because I, I have to first adjust to the lifestyle. It wasn't very easy to manage in such a small, tiny space. It took me about five to six months to get adjusted and really enjoy the lifestyle. So during that time, I also uh, applied to work for different places in the city. Uh, because I wasn't really nomadic and I was kind of scared yeah, of being yeah. nomadic because it was already <laughs> like, you know, like a different lifestyle. And then you jump in, jump into nomadic right away. It, was, it wasn't realistic. <laughs> so it was like a very small, tiny step for me to get here and, and gain more courage along the way to pretty much let go of my fears over the time and this lifestyle is all about that like pushing me over my comfort zone yeah. so for the first two and a half years uh, living in BC exploring around BC I did have a job just like everyone else but it, the job was actually very flexible luckily and that was I was going for living this lifestyle. I knew that I wanted something flexible, something that uh, fun and doesn't take a lot of time so that I have time to go and explore and do what I like to do. Uh, why I still uh, love and enjoy the job. In the beginning, I didn't find it, but I just kind of follow and just asking myself, what is it that I'm curious about I want to do? So I first started with being a barista at Starbucks because I wanted to know about coffee. I wanted to have a coffee shop. So I want to have that experience, you know, um, like working like in the fun. coffee shop. Yeah, it was really fun. And I, I learned so much. Um, but I didn't like the, the to, to work at Starbucks. However, that experience led me to another opportunity where I didn't really expect how much I love sales. So I was kind of like in the between um, working on the coffee industry while selling coffee machine. And I... I didn't think that I would love it in the beginning, but I'm the kind of person that I love talking to people. I love uh, engaging with people. 
because living my nomadic lifestyle, I have that downtime when I get to be alone by myself. And when I'm at work, I get to meet people. So it's kind of give me that balance. Mm-hmm. And, um, and it, it was a really fun job. I have uh, amazing co-workers, amazing managers, and it worked out perfectly for me for almost two years in Vancouver. I think probably more, almost a year, a year and a half or so in that position. And is it helps me so much with my people skills, <laughs> especially coming well, from they have, they the technology. Have Starbucks. <laughs> yeah, they have really good customer service, and I would imagine good training but i just gotta i just gotta ask did they see your resume I, i'm just surprised they even hired you you were so uh well i overqualified. think I, 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 not, I, I know barista is a skill <laughs> let me not get myself in trouble here i've had friends who worked at barista worked as baristas that on coffee shops but i would have just thought she's not gonna stay here but a week or two <laughs> and she's gonna go do something else did they even ask you about it <laughs> Um, I don't remember. I put it okay. on my resume. <laughs> ah, okay. Okay. Um, I, I, I just put my uh, education, maybe just for college. I just mm-hmm. keep it pretty simple. Smart. Uh, and so I, I, to be honest, they kind of hire anyone really, like as long as you have some sort of people skill, they would hire you. And once I have that Starbucks experience, it's a lot easier for me to apply for other positions because they're like, oh, you already know so much about coffee and you already have the people skill that you were trained at Starbucks. So it's like I can get into other jobs pretty easily after that. And it's, it's open up kind of like a, 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 another sector for me working in coffee industry. Right. right. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great lesson right there is to be willing to, you know, do something different and, and maybe horizontal or, you know, it may not be at the level you may think of what you were doing before, but to be open to if you really are curious. I love your question. What am I curious about? And then just go do it and not worry about what other people think or how they'll look at you. And and obviously, exactly, exactly. And, you know, I enjoy that job so much more than when I was working as an engineer. It's so much less stress. Yes. Um, Like, but just selling coffee machine. And I have such uh, great co-workers. Um, everything was working really well for the me. The culture was good. It sounds like and that's, that's yeah. important. A lot of lot of managers and and you know higher ups are missing that right now because we've got a just an exodus of people from corporate America and well from every level. And people are just if they're not happy, they're just not staying just for the bennies anymore. The benefits and the you know, what good are the perks if you're exhausted and unhappy all the time? So, you know, you yeah. might be opening a door for someone to walk through mentally into the next phase of their life just with your example, which I think is, again, courageous and remarkable. And I think that is the job was so flexible. Like, uh, it's, it was amazing that they just like, because I was in sales. So it's mm-hmm. not like a retail. So it depends on the season. So in the summer season, it's a little bit slower. So I can just like take time off anytime. And uh, some some weeks I work for only three days. And for four days, I was able to go and explore Vancouver of BC or outside of Vancouver in the whole region of BC. So um, the whole year, I was just like, uh, get get to see different places and I was just loving the lifestyle and I get to really 
get to understand what van life was about and the more i traveled the more i fell in love with it uh, and so everything was working great for me with that job and in the in the winter time i get to work more because uh, i don't travel as much and there's more gigs there's more uh, opportunities because you're in sales you make a lot of commissions when you get to sell more so in the summertime uh, I, i i don't work as much but in the winter time i work double the amount <laughs> so it's almost yeah, full time so <laughs> yeah every industry has a cyclic cyclical nature like that yeah and, yeah so, so as you're traveling you you're now loving what you do you're happy where you are you're traveling in your van as you i just i've been to uh toronto and one other place i can't remember in canada but i don't remember seeing a lot of vans is that kind of unique or are there a lot of people up there doing the van life um it's very popular in bc mm-hmm. uh not british, so much british columbia? yes okay. british columbia uh is the i i would say it's probably the capital of van life in north america ah, <laughs> that, that, that to say how many how many van lifers are there in bc uh there's thousands of people that uh that live in a van and we actually have meetups uh <laughs> once a year and i think there's a lot of people that are coming from uh the us to uh-huh. bc just for the meetup it's more like a convention van life convention really? what is it called <laughs> so it's, it's pretty fun to be able to um, meet people uh, that that live the same lifestyle absolutely uh, what is the van life convention or van life con or something like van that i think like it comic con van life con okay I'm, I'm gonna yeah. check that out, uh, girl. You are opening up eyes over here. I did not yeah. know this was going on. I really did. And I just, yeah. I keep thinking. I keep thinking every time I talk to another fascinating guest, I'm like, what else do I not know? There's so much going on in the world, and and I get to see it and be transported, as you say, through through your stories and through your lives, and I'm excited about that. Well, let's. Yeah. Um, Let's jump to the book. You've written a book, Living Through Alchemy, A Transformational Journey of Freedom. How long had you been uh, doing van life and, you know, practicing alchemy or understanding alchemy before you wrote the book? What what made you write the book? So I this is my fourth year living the van lifestyle now. So I moved around after living in BC for two and a half years. I decided to travel across Canada. So now I'm in the east coast of Canada in Nova Scotia. Uh, so I'm I'm full time nomadic, almost full time nomadic. So I switched to tra- seasonal van life because the winter here is pretty crazy. Uh, so it's not really safe to live in my van, but uh, in the spring and summer to mm-hmm. fall, I move back to my van and in the winter, if I'm still in the East Coast, then I'm going to rent a place to stay temporarily. Oh, so okay. yeah, okay. so this, this uh, but in BC, I live in my van full time because the weather there is mild enough to stay in my van even in the winter time. Um, So why did I write my book, Alchemy? You know, so when uh, people was first, I I, I worked with uh, some other individual to establish my entrepreneurial uh, career. And uh, they asked me to write a book about my van life since I already have a lot of experience about it and my immigration, how and the reason why I started to immigrate to uh, Canada from the U.S. and all my experiences there. Uh, so I, as I started writing about my van life, I stumbled upon the show called... Um, uh the hero's journey from gaia and this is presented by dr teresa wooler 
Mm -hmm. uh, she is a um, mystery teacher from the Modern Mystery School, which I also become an in initiate of the Modern Mystery School after I learned about alchemy. Um, so as I stumble upon the show, it helps me to realize the journey that I was on as get me to understand why I had to leave the U.S., the catastrophe, the, the, the drama and everything that happened to me there, why it happened, and, uh, and it helped me to live the 3D materialistic lifestyle um, because it have, it have to happen in order for me to live with, to open up a different opportunity for me which mm -hmm. of course when it happened I didn't really understand why and that was like almost seven or eight years ago um, so I was already on the healing journey ever since that was 2014 2015 uh, but I didn't really understand what actually happened to me until I understand the concept of alchemy and that helped me to connect dots and why I had to live the van lifestyle because it gave me so much freedom and opportunity for healing. Whenever I go traveling to remote places, uh, just to be in nature alone by myself. And I, I just do that intuitively, naturally. It's like there's, there's a yearning for me to do it, even though mm -hmm. I didn't quite understand why or what happened. But a lot of healing was taking place the more you spend time with yourself and just uh, be quiet and alone and uh you, you don't have to bombard with other people around you. It's that like your energy is being cleansed. Your mind is a lot clearer. Um, and so you, and you are also more grounded when you are in nature. So the van lifestyle helped me to heal a lot uh, over the years, but I didn't get to understand all of that until I get to see the path and the or the past and the patterns when I understand the stages of alchemy, like why that happened, why I lived the van life, why I I I got involved in that relationship, for instance. So <clears throat> as I wrote my book, I realized my van life was just a part of the story. It wasn't the main story and the healing journey was the main story. And what helped me to understand it was the concept of alchemy. So I, that's, that's why when I wrote my book, I also include the, some journal prompts, questions to help people to reflect, help the reader to reflect. At every stage, of alchemy or every stage of the journey, uh, I ask people to reflect like where you are in the process so you can see a bigger picture, the whole picture of your life. Because when you get to see that, then you get to understand where you are now, where you have been and where you're gonna be going in the future. And it, it helps you to have a clear understanding why you exist, you know, and um, and it set you on the right path of your life to be closer to your purpose. It's like the veil of the curtains uh, is lifting a little bit as you work through that process or that path of alchemy. Because at every state, it presents a struggle, a challenge that you have to overcome. But once you overcome that challenge, um, it's get a little bit clearer where you're going to be on your and next journey. 
Do you feel like overcoming each challenge makes you a little stronger and wiser for the challenges to come? Or is it just a separate lesson and separate purpose every time? No, it's like the it's like the layers of onions. So it's definitely connected mm-hmm. and it's definitely helped me to gain more courage to overcome and more confident as well to overcome the next mountains, the next challenge. Um, so it can be for some challenge is like it's different. But for some challenges, it's like if there's something that nitty gritty, mm-hmm. like the the fear of not being good enough, not being worthy. Sometimes you have to learn that lessons many times, and it can. I feel like it depends on the amount, how much you feel unworthy, or how much you feel not really good enough. You can be going through one lessons, and you feel like, oh, now I feel a little bit better about about my self worth until you stumble on uh, the next challenge and you're like oh it's still the same lessons but it's a lot less uh intense than the previous one that's that's what I experienced on yeah, that's the, a good the fear of not being good enough yeah right right the imposter syndrome kind of thing that's a good point because I I, I as you're talking, I'm just thinking about stages in in my life and the lessons learned. But as I would, you know, reach a new level or a new goal of something that I wanted to achieve once I'd get comfortable and confident there, and then there was something else to do that was even harder, I, I did, you know, feel a little more emboldened to approach it, but then those doubts would come up again, even though I, you know, already overcome that, that I can, you know, it felt like, oh, I can do anything, but then something new is upon you and they're doubters and distractors. And you're right. right you find right. yourself revisiting those old thoughts. Like, am I supposed to be here? Yes. Um, yes. So I it just it. get it's like in the beginning it feels very significant it feels like oh my god this mountain is so big You're so right. high yes. I don't know I'm gonna I, I don't know I'm gonna be able to climb this but like I think but once you overcome that mountains and then for the next challenge it's still it's a lot higher than the previous mountains but then you're like oh I I I went through that I think I can do this yes I think I can do this that's beautiful and and uh you have uh the attitude for your altitude I I wish we could just keep talking this has just been such a fascinating conversation I don't usually listen this much but (laughs) (laughs) thank you so much I found myself (laughs) wanting to hear the next next lesson analogy Uh, metaphor I'm going to encourage folks to uh, connect with you to find your book living through alchemy and which is a fascinating mixture of memoir practical wisdom that encourages readers to find greater joy in life let go of obsessive control and accept the endless flow of transformation that makes up our world. Tell everyone how to connect with you. Tell them where your website is and I'll drop it in the show notes as well. Yeah, so people can check out my book on my website, livingthroughalchemy.com. It's currently available on Lulu and Amazon. Uh, I have two active social media uh, platform. So I'm active on Instagram and people can find me at smileyvv05. That's smiley face, vv the v i v i o five. Uh, I also have a YouTube channel. It's called Personal Growth Through Van Life. Of course, my two most favorite topics. I'm just so passionate about personal growth and uh, van life and traveling. So I just married the, the, the two of them together. And that's what I talk about a lot on my channel. Um, so you can check it out, personal growth through van life on YouTube. I checked out some of your uh, uh, YouTube videos and you are really, really interesting, really passionate, and you share some good, good tips. So I'd encourage people to subscribe so they know when you post a new episode as well. It has been a great pleasure 
VV, I wish you continued success with your nomadic life and, and hope you get a bestseller from your book and look forward to chatting with you again in the future. Thank you so much, Dr. Mo, for having me again. And wasn't that a great program? Oh, love that episode. I enjoyed it. I hope you did too. Please remember to like, subscribe, and share. Learn more about me on my website, drmoanderson.com. That's M-O-E. You can read book excerpts, watch videos, learn about my services that I offer, and book me for a speaking engagement. I'd love to talk with your group, and I'd love to work with you. So until the next time, review, renew, and reu. Thank you.